Hello, and welcome back to another edition of Come Back Stronger. I'm Dana Brooks of Facing Brooks, and I'm joined today with my law partner, Kimmy Hogan. Hey, everybody. Yeah, you're on the other side of the camera this time. You're on the desk this time, so how's that feel? Oh, I love it. <laughs> I've been having so much fun getting to meet all these incredible people and yeah. hearing their stories, but it's fun to be over here, too, especially the story we have today yeah. where Carrie Roan went and did an interview yeah, uh, four parter. Yeah, this is going to be two shows, y'all. This is a this is a big one. Uh, this one couldn't be done in, in just two parts in one show, so we're going to do two shows. And um, we had uh, Jimmy Facing and Carrie Roan, our other law partners who help us with the show. They had some conflicts, so uh, we got Kimmy here in front of the camera today. And Kimmy, you have had to travel to some of these interviews, but uh, Carrie Roan just traveled last week to Austin, Texas, to see our guest today to interview uh, Javon McCormick, and she had to uh, go through quite a bit of storms. We all heard about. About the, the freezing she says I, I love it here and I just got here and then all of a sudden you know I'm locked in and I'm freezing so hopefully you haven't had to deal with any of that in your travels oh well it's been sunny where I've gone I haven't had to go <laughs> buy new winter clothing yet yeah, she got the short end of the stick <laughs> now this this guy he's so incredible and we were so lucky that he made some time for us and, and it was no trouble going to Austin to meet him because he has such an incredible story you talk about Carrie struggling to meet him but when you hear about his struggles you go okay uh, okay, now he, he knows from struggles, so um, he's, he's just an incredible person. We've had the benefit of seeing those interviews, and he struggled s with so much, and um, he's a mixed-race individual, and that was a problem, part of his struggles, his, his identity. Where do I fit in? Because he was finding not, uh, that he wasn't getting much acceptance in black communities, white communities. He was the other, you know, and, uh, and then he didn't have, you know, parents who had it together when they were trying to parent him and his siblings. So this is gonna be a really touching first section. What You've looked at it. What, what were your thoughts on the first section we're about to see? Well, I just love um, how he gives us his background. And mm -hmm. you see that he's, as a young kid, was somebody who had no direction. None. And so he ended up in juvenile pr prison um, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until you know, an officer said to him, look, if you come back, you're going to man prison, yeah, as he so. says. And he realized, wow, I really need to pull myself up by my bootstraps and really start taking yeah. a better look at my life. Yeah, and he's like uh, so many of the people we hear from, they're not just charged with having to raise themselves, which is enough. <laughs> That's quite enough. But uh, people like Javon, uh, a lot of times they're responsible when the adults leave. They're responsible for the children remaining at home and they're just children themselves. And he, he, his story about what he had to do and the situations under which he and his siblings were left unattended without food for days at a time and the things that he had to do um, not so that they could live as his as his mother described it but as they so they could survive so um, I'm really excited about this this first segment and so we'll, we'll we're gonna have a, a short break and we'll be back right after this I like that people who don't have the money to pay for lawyers they can come to a contingency fee lawyer someone like us who only gets paid when we recover for them and they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with giants you are actually just coming to us, not paying us anything, and if we're successful in getting you yeah. money, we get paid. And the more money we get for you, the more money we get. So our interests are totally aligned. And it's a wonderful system because otherwise, how many people can afford to go hire a lawyer by the hour just so they can have their day in court? That would be almost no one. That would mean justice is only available in America to rich people otherwise. But the contingency fee agreement allows everybody to go in on equal footing. It, le it levels the playing field. But it's to me, it's saying we're, we're equal. Okay, just because you have all those resources behind you doesn't mean I have to take whatever you give me. I've got a lawyer that I can afford and stand up to you on the same, same playing field, yeah. equal ground in front of a judge, and I will get treated the same way those big corporations will be treated. Yeah, I'm excited about this first segment. Um, Javon is a natural leader, despite the fact that he was thrust into an environment he had no preparation for. Um, his story is inspiring, um, and it's a long one. It's going to take a while just to show you his journey before we can even get back to the Comeback Stronger. So we're going to start with the first segment right now. So Javon McCormick, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. You're such an interesting story, and um, you know you, you came essentially from the ghetto in Ohio and have become the CEO of a publishing company now, and you have such a fascinating story. I want to talk all about it. But first, um, when I came in, I called you JT, and you said, I don't like to be called JT anymore. So, <laughs> so what's that all about? All right, so I'm going to give you the story behind this. Yeah. So in my early 20s, so I'm 49, 
So we're going back to early 90s. Yeah. In my early 20s when I was trying to get on people's calendars, uh, land appointments, could not get on people's calendars. So one gentleman was nice enough to get on the phone with me. Uh -huh. And he asked me, he said, hey, how did you get a black first name in an Irish last name. Right? Because my name is Javon McCormick. <laughs> yeah. And what was funny is that was the first time I knew my last name was Irish. I had never heard that before. So I laughed and I was like, oh, wow, I just found out my last name's Irish. So people couldn't figure you out from paper. People couldn't figure yeah. me out. And, and so, but they saw Javon. Mm -hmm. And so when I hung up the call, I said, oh, that's why I'm not getting appointments. So my name's Javon Thomas McCormick. So I said, okay. I'm gonna go by JT. Uh -huh. I'll be damned if the next week I didn't get on people's calendars, it filled up, because you didn't know who JT McCormick was. Isn't that terrible though? Horrible. So they're making the race-based judgment based on your first based name. Based on the name. That's awful. And, and I say this to people all the time, whether we want to admit this as a society or not, if you went to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, you went to all three, mm -hmm. but at the top of that res resume, it says Martavius Johnson, you're, you're judged before anyone even gets down to where you went to school. Mm -hmm. So, what, back during the, the George Floyd murder, when the protests started happening, yeah. I made the decision to change my name to Javon. And the reason being was I found what was going on at the time to be incredibly shallow yeah. and status signaling. And so I said, okay, wait a minute. Blackout Tuesday on social media. Uh, we're, we're arguing over a syrup bottle. And I said to myself, uh, this is ridiculous. So I read an article and it said that there were only three black Fortune 500 uh, CEOs. Mm -hmm. And the names are Marvin Ellison. And I love these guys because they've got to the top of, of the game. Yeah. So Marvin Ellison, Kenneth Frazier, and Roger Ferguson. Okay. So three very ambiguous ethnic free names. Right. And I said to myself, wow, there's no Javon there. Yeah. And so I said, that's it. Okay. I've made it to the CEO chair. I'm going to change my name and start going by Javon. And it wasn't so much for me. It was for all of those kids, the Martavius, mm. the Ravante, the Laquanda, La the Lucretia, all of the, the ethnic kids that I grew up with yeah. so they could see Okay, wow, a Javon made it to the CEO chair. A guy chair. just like me. Yes. Somebody from my hood made it to the CEO chair. Made it to the CEO chair. So what was your childhood like? Oh, gosh, you, you opened a the door there, didn't you? So my dad was a, uh, my dad was black. He was a black man, and he was a pimp and drug dealer mm -hmm. in the 70s. And along the way, he fathered 23 children. <gasps> wow. I'm one of 23. Wow. And my mother is white. Mm-hmm. And I'm her only child, but my mother grew up in an orphanage, 1950s institutional orphanage mm. where the kids were neglected, beat, abused. Oh, that's terrible. In Ohio, right? In Ohio. Okay. So when she turned 17 years old, they gave her a small suitcase, $20, and said, good luck, there's the world. She didn't get adopted. No. Oh, my God. No, she grew up in the orphanage. And so you said earlier something that was interesting, too. Your last name is McCormick, yes. which is your mom's last name. My mom's last name. When, my, when my mom went into labor... Uh, my dad was nowhere around. So when my mom had me, I was all she had in the world. Mm. She didn't have any family either. So she goes, I'm going to give him my last name. Problem is my mom got that last name in the orphanage. We have no clue where this name comes really? from. She has no clue why, where, how she was given the last name. So here I am today. And, and it's actually for me, it's a I'm very proud of it yeah. because it's like I've got to create my own legacy. So I love the fact, you know, my four children, last name McCormick, my wife's last name is McCormick. So it's actually a big deal for me now that, okay, this is our legacy that we've created. And so when you were growing up, um, it was rough for you, right? You had a uh, single mom and you made some pretty bad choices as a kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what were some of the bad things that you did and, and the things that landed you in juvie? So yes, growing up harsh. My mother and I, we were on welfare, uh -huh. uh, lived in public housing, mm -hmm. and, and you got to remember, this is, a, this is the 70s. Right, in early and, 80s. And, okay. and I was mixed race, 
So half white, half black in the 70s, not a good look. And with no dad around. With no dad around. Yeah. You know, occasionally he would pick me up, but. And this weird McCormick last name that doesn't really fit in with the black culture, and then you also didn't really fit in with the uh, white culture with the Javon name. Exactly. Right. Black people didn't like me because I was half white. White people didn't like me because I was half black. I was never white enough. I was never black enough. So, you know, as a kid, you have this identity crisis, you're constantly called zebra, Oreo cookie, oh half gosh. breed. Oh yeah, <laughs> it, it, was, it was harsh. And to, to make it worse, it wasn't so much what I went through, it was watching what, what my mother yeah. had to, to go through, watching people spit in her face and call her the, the N-word lover. Um, and, and there was nothing you could do about it. Being evicted from public housing because they didn't want uh, race mixing in the public housing. So you're coming home, all of your belongings are on the lawn, and oh the God. manager comes out and he says, no inward lovers can live here. Oh my God, So that was harsh. Yeah. But you, you learn a lot. And well, so let me interrupt you for a second though. Yeah. So it seems to me that you'd want to protect your mom from all that, right? You're kind of the man of the household, but yet you, it seems like you made a decision to go in a different route, right? Yeah. So you know, you know, as a child, you, you, you don't want to see your mother go through it, but at the same time, you don't really know how to protect your mother. Mm. You know, when I was with my dad on those occasional weekends, I watched my dad collect money from prostitutes. I knew it was going to be chaotic. I watched my dad's house be raided by law enforcement. Oh my uh, I watched him go to jail and be taken away in handcuffs. So. It, it was just chaos all the time. I, I frequently went to bed o on Friday night and didn't eat again until I went to school on Monday and got my free government welfare lunch to, oh to eat. Gosh. So it was chaotic. Wow. Let's talk about it a little bit more when we get back. Wow. That's just the first segment. What do you think? I think it's so cool about how he changed his name back from JT to Javon. Yeah. You know, in our Empower Plant uh, group on Facebook, we always talk about the importance of representation, right. of having women at high levels of government and companies mm -hmm. and the same thing, mm -hmm. showing diversity. Yeah. And I think that's such a meaningful way for him to kind of go back to his roots. Yeah, and I think he, he probably had a stunning realization that despite his history and probably how he identifies, he recognizes now he's in a position of privilege. Yes. And he has a, he has a voice and he can use it to help people uh, behind him come up and have a better experience. So he's, he's impressive. So we'll learn more about him right after this. When you come into my firm, you see a lot of faces that look like yours. You see a lot of people that had the same problem before they got to work. You know, a lot of people who left kids with mismatched shoes and half, you know, a lunch bag, you screaming, you know, just because you had an appointment you had to make. You know, we get you. We get you. You have to go to a lawyer that will understand your story as a woman. Yeah. Because women have different stories than men do, and that's just a fact of life. And if you're a woman that's been injured, either through a slip and fall or a trip and fall in an auto accident, you have to go to a lawyer that's gonna understand what your daily existence was like before, what it's like now, what the injury means to your entire family, and what you need to do to come back and be where you were before, and even come back and be stronger than where you were before. They just need to have the courage to pick up the phone because we are going to take the burden of this accident or you being hurt off of your shoulders, we're gonna put it on our shoulders. Right. So you don't have to worry about it. Exactly. You can worry about your everything else in your life, but not this accident. We're gonna worry about that for you. Yeah, Javon's gonna tell us this next segment, a little bit more detail about that childhood he, uh, Carrie opened the door for. Uh, this one's, this one will hit you in the gut, I think. Mm -hmm. Take a look. So you've got kind of a chaotic life going on with your dad a little bit more stability with your mom and you're caught in between and then you started making some pretty bad mistakes as a kid. What, what were some of those mistakes? I don't know if I necessarily call them mistakes. I, I, I was getting in fights and actually I'll tell you the first time how I landed in, in juvenile. My dad, I had ended up being taken away from my mom by my dad and I was living with my dad his prostitute and my three half brothers and sisters. Oh my gosh. And my dad decided one day that he was gonna to go to England. Mm -hmm. So he leaves and just says, hey, I'm going to England for two weeks, I'll be back. He was actually gone a year, but he said he was going for two weeks. And he leaves me with and the prostitute. And you're left with a prostitute and some half brothers? And my brothers. half brothers and sisters. Oh my gosh. And the prostitute's a horrific heroin addict. So Sunday afternoon. Could this story get any worse? <laughs> <laughs> so so Sunday afternoon, she leaves. She said, I'll be back. I'm going to get a pack of cigarettes. 
She was gone for three weeks. And it was February, we were in Ohio, and my half-brothers and sisters were four, three, and two. Oh my gosh. Wednesday afternoon, I'm supposed to be in school, it's February, but I'm not gonna leave my half-brothers and sisters. Mm. How, old, how old were you? I was 12. Okay. Whew. And Wednesday afternoon, it hits me, we don't have any food. And so I had to tell my four-year-old half-sister, the oldest, to babysit so I can go down to the store and steal food. So I go steal food, I come back, and immediately I realize, oh my God, we don't have diapers for the two-year-old. So I have to potty train my little brother, and I, I set him on the toilet, he's crying, I'm crying, and I look at him and I said, hey man, until something comes out, this is how it's going down. <laughs> and you know, it, but, yeah. so she was gone for three weeks, and for me, the greatest stress that I have ever felt in life, every day I worried, would they disconnect the electricity? Mm would they shut off the water? And I would literally worry about that hourly because I didn't know what we would do. Mm -hmm. No one knew we were there. I was supposed to be in school. I was gonna ask that, yeah. My, my dad's in England. My mother doesn't know where I am because my dad had taken me from my, my mom. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't know where I am. How did you guys eat those, those three weeks? I, I kept stealing food. Okay, and did you get caught eventually? No, wow. I, I kept stealing food. So you asked me how I ended up juvenile. I'll fast forward. Prostitute comes home three weeks later, and I'm 12, and I get in her face, and I said, where the F have you been? She beat me so bad, and I mean, I fell to the ground, my ear's bleeding, she's kicking me, she's punching me, and I run away. Oh. I get brought back to the house, and the second beating is worse than the first. Oh, I'm so sorry. So by the grace of God, one of my uncles picks me up the next day, my dad's brother, and he takes me to another one of my dad's girlfriend's house. And yeah, exactly, I was the same way. But, but what was nice was they had a decent house. Uh, she bought me some clothes and I was eating each day. I had a little lunch money, so I was like, okay, this is great. Friday night rolls around and she's a horrific alcoholic. And I'm looking a little too much like my dad right now. Oh, no. She starts beating me. I'm tired of getting beat at yeah, this point. Yeah, of course. I fight back. She calls the police. Yeah. I had to go to juvenile. And that was the first time I went to juvenile. Here's what was so... Um, that might have rescued you. you it, know? It, it did and it didn't. Yeah. Because here was the pain. My dad was in England. And, and literally only God knew where he was. My mom had no clue where I was. No one knew I was in juvenile. I was stuck. No one knew so I was there. you couldn't get out. I was there almost three months. Wow. And, and, and I don't care what anyone says. People need to understand this. They call it uh, juvie, juvenile detention. It's, it's kid prison. It's mm -hmm. juvenile prison. When I got put in solitary confinement and I was 12 years old and you're in this pitch black room that two correction officers just threw you in and you don't know where your parents are, that is some of the most mind numbing it's scary, chaotic, like what's going to happen to me? Right. And you're stuck in a dark room, a dark hole. How did that not break you? I mean, it's breaking me just listening to it. But at 12 years old, I mean, how did you just not break? My mom used to say this to me when I was a kid. We never really lived. We survived. Mm -hmm. So I was raised to know how to survive. Mm -hmm. And that's all I ever really knew was how do you survive? How do you just keep going forward? And that mentality served me well. And so when I got out of uh, juvenile, I ended, I ended up going back to juvenile uh, three times in, in total. Uh, one was for fighting a kid that was making fun of me because I was uh, homeless at one point. I used to carry a little suitcase with me. Uh, but yeah, stealing, fighting, and beating up my dad's Girlfriend. And there was no like rehabilitation effort. I mean, you know, no. they just keep throwing you in juvie. <laughs> you just keep going. Now, God. here was the rehabilitation. And, and to this day, oh, I, I would so much like to find this gentleman. Last time I'm in juvenile, gentleman gets down on one knee and he says, come here. And I mean, huge corrections officer. And he said, come here. And he gets in my face. He said, if you come back here again, you're going to man prison. Now, I'm 49 years old, 
And to this day, the term man prison just doesn't sound right. <laughs> I, I, I don't oh, want to no. go to man prison. I want right. nothing to do with that. Oh. And that's, that single-handedly is what kept me from going back to juvenile because I never wanted to find out what man prison it looked like. It flipped the switch for you. It totally did. I'm like, okay, not coming back here because they're telling me I got to go to man prison. What was the worst experience for you in juvie? I know being in solitary, solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, yeah. hands down. Just now, alone in there in the dark all day long? And, and no one knows where you are. Jeez. So you're just, just lost. You're just lost. Not even a person at that point, really. Not even a person. You're just you're just something in a dark room that occasionally gets fed. That is just heart wrenching to hear, especially yeah. at 12 years old. It, it's no one knew I, I was there. That was the the hardest thing. Like, where's my mom? Mm -hmm. Where's my dad? Nobody's coming for you. No one's coming. No one's coming. And no one cares. But yet you had the will to go on. Again, my, my mom taught me to survive. Mm -hmm. um, she used to teach me this, this phrase. She says, sometimes necessity has an ugly face. Yeah. But I have so many little phrases that, be it my mom, my dad. Uh, you know, for, for, for all my father's shortcomings, he gave me a lot of great lessons in life that have served me to this day. Where are your parents now? My father passed away three years ago. I, I went to his funeral. I, I had not seen him in 30 plus years. Ooh. And I went to his funeral. And for all the money that man made as a pimp and drug dealer, he died flat broke. Mm. And it made my day to be able to pay for his funeral. Uh, my mother is, she lives in Wisconsin with my stepfather. And she's, her health is, is not, Good. Uh, she has uh, stage three or four Parkinson's, oh. and so, but yeah, she still she still moves, and we joke with one another still, just like we did when we were poor. That's good. So when we come back, I want to talk about what your life was like after juvie, getting your GED, and and kind of starting off as an adult. Yeah, I can't wait to the next show when we cover his big comeback story. But you know, we did hear that one little thing we always hear at a comeback story, uh, comeback stronger story, and that's the catalyst. Who's the person who got your attention and changed your trajectory? And a lot of times it's a, it's a good person doing something good. Sometimes like this, it's a scary person scaring you. So, yeah. Him looking at, okay, well, I've yeah. been pushing pushing my luck and now I just don't want to go to man yeah. prison. Yeah, Let's as bad as it was for him, you know, he's a 12 year old and he's parenting. He's having the stress of worried about electrical and, and, and water cut off and stealing food and, and, and potty training a child, training. you know, and he's got that on him and then he's in solitary confinement, but he has this threat of something that could be worse. So it's interesting. We'll talk about how that motivated him when we come back after this. This is the most rewarding job. I, I yeah. tell people, anybody knows about me in my past, I was a social worker and, and I loved the, um, the spirit of the job. I loved the, the mission, but I felt really, I felt like I couldn't do as much for them as I wanted to do. You meet your client where they are, you know, you, you meet them where they are, not where you want them to be, not where you want them to, to get it together and come into your lovely office and act appropriately. You know, sometimes I have to go to your house so you can be real, so you can show me, so you can break down. I don't mind doing that. That's part of the process. But the more I can do that, the more you do feel better. And like you can be somebody who can go into any office at any time and, and maintain your composure because you, you were able to be as vulnerable as you needed to be with somebody that you needed to trust to get you through this. And once I do that and I get them on the other side of it, they, it finally occurs to them, it's like a light bulb goes off. It finally occurs to them that Dana didn't do this. I did this. Mm -hmm. I got myself here. Yeah, Javon McCormick is actually, uh, I don't know if it's come out yet, but he is the CSO of Scribe Media, and that is a uh, company that helps people, anybody's got a book idea in their head, he helps uh, bring that to fruition and make that a reality for people. And uh, he laughs about it because he says, I, I have a GED, yet I'm, you know, head of this publishing house. So I how love, funny is that? I love it. In next episode, you're going to hear his comeback story and a little bit more about his work history, but he also was the CEO of a software company yeah. and he never knew coding. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this episode was very focused on his backstory uh -huh. and oh, 
it made my heart heavy yeah. to hear what he went through. And I know that the story gets better and he his life turns around. Mm -hmm. But the reality that so many children are living in that same situation that yeah. he was in yeah. just makes me sad. And especially during the pandemic, yeah. uh, people are struggling and yeah. they don't. That isolation able. factor that he talked about. Yes, yes. And they can't go to school, some yeah. of them. And so they're not getting that, that hot meal. And yeah. it's just. Yeah. It's tough. We, we hear about things called ACEs, the uh, Adverse Childhood Incidences, and I'm sure I've talked about these before, but um, you look at children and you look at their early childhood development and you see how many of those they have. And it could be something as simple as um, and common as a parent uh, getting divorced or splitting up. It could be uh, relocating, moving, uh, having uh, attending a different school every year mm -hmm. is considered, you know, a, a disruptive part in the child's life. You know, geographical relocation, that sort of thing. When I was a social worker working in schools, I would see just um, the anxiety level in children who really weren't sure what bus to get on to go home today. Am I going to this house? Am I going to that house? Who's picking me up? You know, do they like each other? Am I going to be in the middle of their conflict? And still, not to this level. Yes. <laughs> you know, this guy's got an ace hitting him in the face every day from the minute he's born. I just, I don't even know what makes a person keep going. I get, he's in the cold, in the winter, worried about electricity, having to potty train a two-year-old yeah. as a 12-year-old. Yeah, with just incredible. being parented, though, also by you know, a mother who was herself an orphan, who was never, like Carrie pointed out, adopted. It's one thing to get a child all the way through you know, foster care into adulthood, but when they don't actually get adopted by and attached to a family, you know, they, they just feel like they're just floating, they're just unattached in the world. And so you think about what sort of maternal instincts she would have to parent him. I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she did it because uh, it sounds like from what we've heard so far about Javon, his mother was a, was a good force in his life despite her obvious limitations and what she was able to do for him. Uh, his father, you know, just, just you know sounds like he just came in and just just brought a firestorm with him wherever he went and just left chaos in his wake no oh, absolutely yeah and this and this young man you know he has the wherewithal to know i don't have control over whether the lights are on and there's water and i don't have control over i, I can only steal so much what happens if i get you know caught who's going to watch out for him back then you know children would get taken away from parents when they were unsupervised like that and children were very aware, well aware of that and so to protect their parents, they would not ask for help. You know, you would think, why don't they go to a neighbor? Why don't they mention, to a, why don't they mention it to a teacher? Why doesn't a truant officer come and check and see where he is? But, you know, people learn to stay under the ra radar to protect themselves. And he kept saying nobody knew where we were. Nobody he was missing He felt like him. he was totally, totally Nobody alone. was missing him. But we're going to have another show, another episode on this, and you're going to hear great things that he has done, and I hope you stick with us next time. Follow us on Facebook and join our Comeback Stronger group. We'll see you next time. I like that people who don't have the money to pay for lawyers, they can come to a contingency fee lawyer, someone like us who only gets paid when we recover for them, and they can go toe to toe with giants. You are actually just coming to us, not paying us anything, and if we're successful in getting you yeah. money, we get paid. And the more money we get for you, the more money we get. So our interests are totally aligned. And it's a wonderful system because otherwise, how many people can afford to go hire a lawyer by the hour just so they can have their day in court? Right. That would be almost no one. That would mean justice is only available in America to rich people otherwise. But the contingency fee agreement allows everybody to go in on equal footing. It, it levels the playing field. But it's to me, it's saying we're, we're equal. Okay, just because you have all those resources behind you doesn't mean I have to take whatever you give me. I've got a lawyer that I can afford who can stand up to you on the same, same playing field, yeah. equal ground in front of a judge, and I will get treated the same way those big corporations will be treated.